Welcome to an ESPN News Tuesday, or as we like to call it, mailing it in. <laughs> Bomani, what do you like on the show today? Three Cavaliers topics, because it's still LeBron's world, guys. Dale, papi. Should Dan Gilbert have consulted LeBron before making a GM change? This is stubborn, short-sighted, does not show the common courtesy that LeBron has earned, which is some power that he values in the organization of at least being consulted before making a change like this. He's been publicly disappointed by the idea that Griffin is now gone. It's a wayward franchise that hasn't been any good except when LeBron James is there. It seems to me that he has earned the power of at least consultation on something like this, especially when he values power. Yeah, there are a couple of levels of this. One, Jason Lloyd of The Athletic wrote a good story breaking down what happened on this, but one point he makes is Dan Gilbert lets everybody's contract go all the way to the end before he makes some sort of decision because Dan Gilbert is the sort of guy who does that sort of thing apparently just because he can. I don't know if he needed to call LeBron. It seems like something you would probably do given LeBron's power in the organization. Whether he called him or not, everything in the NBA is going haywire right now. The Cavs are dead at the center of it, and as of the moment, Nobody's in charge. That's what's super weird about this. The day that you're hearing about the Cavs might be in play for Jimmy Butler is the same day you're hearing, hey, Gilbert and Griffin don't think alike on this sort of thing. And it makes you wonder, is it because Griffin was trying to play for now, this year, and thinking about getting rid of future pieces to get something for right now? And Dan Gilbert said, nope, I'm not going to let LeBron leave again without having something in place, which means I want to keep Kevin Love and Kyrie if the eventuality happens that LeBron leaves here. You guys got it all wrong. Dan Gilbert wants his man in that position. David Blatt. <laughs> That's right. David Blatt is coming back, buddy. That's it. That's the man that he's going to pick for that job. I would love it if they did, though. Can you imagine how amazing that would be? That would be like a straight-up soap opera. David Blatt back from wherever he's coaching with his passport. Okay, we're going to entertain that as an idea. If you're trying to run LeBron out of town, that's one way to do it. Would Chauncey Billups be a good fit in the calf front office? All right, it wasn't that long ago Chauncey Billups was a basketball player. Then he was doing a very good job for us here at this broadcasting network. And now he's apparently about to be running a basketball team if he wants to because Dan Gilbert wants Chauncey Billups to be the man that's over the general manager, like the visionary for the whole thing. How does anybody know if that's going to work? How would anybody really have an idea if Chauncey Billups is the right guy for that job? It just seems very hard to believe that given everything that's going on right now, the best guy for that job for the Cavaliers is a guy who's never done this job before or anything really close to it. We do this all the time in this sport, though. A guy who is a leader on the court like Danny Ferry or Vladi Divac or Chauncey Billups, we say you want to lead the whole organization whether you're qualified or not. And here's the peril of that. Once upon a time, Derek Fisher and Steve Kerr were exactly exactly the same. They commanded the same salary. They didn't have any experience for those coaching jobs. They were both going for $25 million over five years. Derek Fisher chose what he chose to attach himself to another guy who wasn't qualified for that position, which is Phil Jackson, who ruined his entire career. And Steve Kerr, you saw how that turned out for Steve Kerr. Where's Derek Fisher now? Where's Steve Kerr? It kind of matters what the players are in terms of whether or not this job is going to be done well. Actually, we kind of know where Derek Fisher is, and Matt Barnes is right around the corner. Yeah, wherever he is. Should the calf trade for Jimmy Butler or Paul George? I love this time of year. Basketball has really co-opted June and July with stories like this. We probably shouldn't answer this question until we know what they're trying to get in return for those pieces because that sort of matters. I think you want to add Jimmy Butler and Paul George to what the Cavs are already doing, but you have to trade either Kyrie or Love to do that because they don't have the pieces to make it happen otherwise. If it's just for Kevin Love or just for Kyrie Irving, it's not something I'm interested in doing because I'm not making my team that much better. Yeah, but I think the Cavs need three things. They need another playmaker, they need a rim protector, and they need somebody else who can get their own shot. Jimmy Butler can't be the rim protector, but he can help you with initiating offense, and he can get his own shot. For the roster that they've got, even if they made trades because they're overloaded in the front court, to me, Jimmy Butler fits more of the holes that this roster actually has. That's the guy that I'd go for, and that's before we consider the fact that his contract's a little bit longer, and he's not itching to get to L.A., because I don't give a damn how good the Cavs are. If that dude wants to be in L.A., he ain't settler for no Cleveland, man. That's not how wanting to be in L.A. works. You know who really is going to be if uh, Butler goes to, uh, to the calf? Oh, here we go. Dwayne Wade, there he's the one who wants to play with LeBron again. Right. <laughs> but you know what? LeBron doesn't want anything to do with you, Wade. 
He's pushing you aside. He's grabbing Jimmy Butler before you. You got the message, buddy? You're done finished. You know what Dwayne Wade wants to do more than anything else? Make $25 million a year. And the only place that's happening is in Chicago. Would it be crazy for the Knicks to trade Chris Plasprosingas? Yeah, so Adrian Wojnarowski of the Vertical says that they are looking, they, the Knicks, looking to trade Chris Plasprosingas because what you do with the fan base that you have abused year after year after year is to tell them, hey, there's one glimmer of hope you got. Yeah, we're thinking about shipping him out of town also. The only reasonable explanation to me as to why the Knicks in their front office would want this out there is that Phil Jackson is trying to get fired. That's the only thing. Fire me before I set fire to this whole thing by trading the future well for clarification purposes and this might be semantics willing to trade isn't quite the same as what was reported which is they are listening to some offers and maybe if something great comes in they'd be willing to do it it's the only piece they have that anybody would want they need to start over there in new york they need to start over there and they promised their future to phil jackson dolan has said he is riding out the contract with phil jackson and once you get into that territory you're a really bad team in a real Really bad conference and you've only got one valuable piece it's not absurd to listen to offers well phil jackson will take your call if you find out where he is what <laughs> private island he's uh, he's in that now you know it all depends on where the cl- right. all depends where the closest cell tower is you realize you're gonna have to hire a private investigator to find phil jackson to take your call what do you make of the new details of nick saban and Lane Kiffin's feud. I feel like they kind of gave us the details already by parting. Here's the video of this feud. This is from Phil Savage's new book. He used to do some radio for Alabama. And what he's saying here is this isn't an argument. Nick Saban has already told us this isn't an argument. He calls it a bleep chewing. He just bleep chewed uh, Lane Kiffin for reportedly saying uh, to his players, dumb players make dumb plays. Look at the score there. They're up 28. And apparently Nick Saban said back to him, dumb offensive coordinator call dumb plays. I like Nick Saban doing that to Lane Kiffin, who's mistreating the players. Yeah, that's the single most endearing thing you ever could have showed me about Nick Saban, because we all wonder what made him fly off the handle like that. Normally, you would assume it's because Lane wasn't running the ball, but the idea that he refused to let Lane Kiffin insult the players in such a way, I mean, that's kind of got to make you like the dude, even if you're not inclined to do so, right? Well, and now Lane Kiffin is someplace in Florida handing out the scholarship to, to sixth graders. That's what he's doing. <laughs> he is. Yeah, there is curious. that. Yeah, and uh, hanging out at Blue Martini in Boca Raton. He's doing that, too. Coming up next on my son's TV show, Sugar Ray Leonard. You remember those, uh, those fights uh, against the Cuban boxers? You beat them up, all of them. <laughs> I was oh, rooting man. for you. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, thank you. I, no, I believe that's him. Right, that's I believe right. him. I believe yeah, him. Right. He's not making that no. up. Joining us at the beach today, Sugar Ray Leonard. Always enjoy talking to this guy. Honest, one of the greatest boxers of all time. He won the gold at the 1976 Olympics, world titles in five weight divisions. Let's talk to him. All right, after turning pro, you said you turned pro, you won a championship two years later. Like, how much fun was it being Sugar Ray Leonard in 1979? Too much fun. Too, uh, well, I'll tell you what, it was almost too much fun. It, 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 i tell you what, creating or having a f- little fame, especially when you come from nothing or humble beginnings, uh, it's, it's very seductive. You know, you start making money, you start becoming more famous, people start recognizing you. Uh, then when people start recognizing you outside your, your hometown, your state, or whatever, and then, out, then when people start recognizing you, uh, you know, in China or in Russia or whatever, it's, it's, it's seductive. It can be seductive. So, but I kept my feet pretty much on the ground, but there were times I, I lost perspective and I, you know, I thought I could do whatever I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, as a, as a fighter or ex-fighter, because I retired in back, what, 1982, you know, I, I got involved with drugs because I wasn't happy. Um, alcohol became a factor and, uh, those things uh, almost took me down. It, you know, it almost took me down, all, way down. And I pulled myself back because I have good people with me. I have family, and uh, I also want to be a better person, too. What's the time that you're remembering there? It seemed like you were lost in thought thinking about the the way down. Like, what's the time? What was happening then? The, the time was 1982. Uh, I had I retired because... 
I had a detached retina. But my ophthalmologist said, Ray, if you want to fight again, you can fight again. But, you know, majority of the, uh, the fans, majority of people wanted me to retire because they said, Ray, you know what, you have fame, you have money, don't risk it. Uh, and that was very difficult to, uh, to um, understand or interpret or comprehend when you are that young and that successful and that famous because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I wanted to fight. But, uh, I mean, again, I'm looking back in retrospect. I mean, thank God for medical technology, the advancement. Uh, I did okay. So the hardest part to deal with or the escape that was required by drugs or alcohol was losing the identity of boxing? That's what led you there? Like I was, maybe I was bored. Maybe I was too immature. Maybe all those, I think all those things are factors in me, in my, in my quest or in my journey. And all those things uh, that I was able to endure and then get out of has made me the person that I am today. You can pick any moment on the resume, but just one. What would you say is the happiest moment Sugar Ray ever had in boxing? Wow, that's 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 uh, that's that's tough. Um, I I I re- I think that or I feel that the the fight with Tommy Hearns back in 1981, September of 1981, uh, when I unified the title, uh, we fought for the undisputed welterweight crown and. I beat Tommy Hearns, and I was a major underdog at that time. That that comes to comes to mind with being major. That fight seems like it might have been fun afterward, but during it sounds like it had to be miserable. <laughs> and before it doesn't sound like it, it sounds so, a little scary before no, too. But Tommy, no, it, it, you, you're so right with that. Uh, Tommy Hearns was, I mean, he just annihilated his opponents. Tommy was such a, he was a freak of nature, six two. I mean, long arms and powerful and what have you. And uh, most people thought, even my brother Roger thought I was going to lose the fight. But um, I, I prevailed. Wait a minute, how does that conversation go? Even your brother told you to your face you're going to lose this fight? Well, he didn't tell me in my face. He told me after the fight. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> smarter, yeah, smarter yeah. way to approach that oh, he's, oh, he, No, my brother's smart. Roger is pretty smart. Gonna bring my father in here. Give us just a second, Sugar Ray, as we change the camera angle. Okay. Sugar Ray, nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Thank you, my friend. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm doing fine. You remember those uh, those fights uh, against the Cuban boxers? You beat them up, all of them. (laughs) (laughs) All all those are I remember that from the Olympics. Yeah, from the Olympics. (laughs) Oh, he he just now he this guy here was so so dominant. He just he knocked out everybody except me. But he knocked That's out right. everybody. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I was oh, rooting man. for you. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, thank you. I, no, I believe That's him. Right. That's I believe right. him. I believe That's him. Right. He's not making that no. up. He was rooting for I was rooting for you, Chicken Ray. Highly questionable is broadcast from the Clevelander Hotel on beautiful South Beach, Miami. Time to play the game that is not ready to lose you. Yeah, we're going to miss him. Yeah, that's no good. He's leaving later this week. Do you question? You give us topics and events, and we question them. Do you question Antonio Brown's sincerity? And we're not giving any setup here on what this could be. I don't even feel comfortable telling a joke on the front end. It could wind up being fireable after I see the video. The best commission in the game. I'm oh. to celebrate now. Let's do it. Let's do it. I do think he's being sincere. He said he's the best commissioner in the game, a game that has one commissioner. (laughs) I don't have anything to add to that, really. Where were they? Were they in uh, Goodell's office there? Where Goodell? It wasn't but a couple of months ago that they were telling us that Goodell was staunch about these celebration rules and was sending out videos to people on how they could celebrate. Goodell has done a total 180 on this. I guess that'll bring Antonio Brown to your office. He likes to dance more than any of them. There it is, though. If I want to see something on Snapchat for you going to Goodell's office, let me see the dap routine that he met you with at the door, right? I mean, I figure after the draft, Goodell just stays in practice by dapping up the players that show up for friendly meetings and disciplinary hearings. Boy, that was in Fidel Goddell's office. He must be very happy to be out of under his desk. Yeah, that is That's true. Right. <laughs> I figure when you're looking for him, he is down there like tell him I'm busy. 
We don't know if that's where Antonio Brown found him and then pulled him out in order to be in that Snapchat video. Do you question if Shaq will fit the modern NBA? The modern NBA, what does that mean? A three-point shooting Shaq? Let's see what we've got here. Steph Curry. Oh, oh good wow. touch. The grace and touch that Shaq has always shown from distance at the rim. Hey. <laughs> wow. Off the glass. Wow. The big fundamental. Did he mean to do that? Who's guarding that? Like, even to this day, who's guarding him? He is one for 22, his career from three. And tell me you're not surprised that there's a one next to that 22. Tell me you're not surprised. Well, he might be able to shoot that three, but I think that he's going to run into problems getting back on defense. Yeah, there is that. <laughs> there is that. Do you question if this kid should be embarrassed? It is a kid and his grandfather. We love embarrassing kids. We got too much air. Oh, stolen! Oh! Oh! oh, oh got him! Oh! Oh! Paul Pierce with the oh! steal and the handle. Oh, we got to come up with somebody else. We already have a Paul Pierce. Oh! Vince Carter! Oh! There you go. Oh! Oh! Manu Ginobili! Oh! 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 Oh, I feel like Manny Ginobili is stretching what people are willing to believe. Oh, 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 the line. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's what's crossing the line. It's just, you know, a little, little too far. Oh, oh, I, I don't know if the kid should be embarrassed. Oh, yeah, I mean, but his grandfather's grown, and I can't really tell how old his grandfather is in his picture. Oh, Okay, but the steel that involves you on your face and yeah. someone off camera is clearly killed with a sword. Yeah, nah, I think that's all with a spice. You just know it. Just... Wow. <laughs> I don't even think we need to answer the question. You just wanted to watch the old man give him yeah, that work. The it. old man we think is old, but we really don't yeah, know. We don't know. What happened? What's the matter? I wish I could play basketball with some grandkids, you know? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, wow. He took a circuitous route to get there. All right. Time to play the game that uses butter as the other end. See? Oh, no. You tell us what to watch on television tonight. We tell you if we're intrigued or not. So that's what smells like shrimp scampi. On ESPNU, Sports Science. I'm generally interested in this. Let's check in with Markel Fultz. He's going to be the number one pick in the draft, and he is testing his skills against some dodgeball players. Three, two, one, go! Fultz dodges the first ball with a step-back move, which stops his forward momentum in just 12 hundredths of a second. Then, to evade the second throw, he uses his 36-inch max vert to raise his center of mass more than five feet above the court. He beats the third defender with a spin move as fast as Russell Westbrook's. And then he evades the fourth with a crossover as quick as Kyrie Irving's. And with only one man to beat, Fultz rises up and throws it down. That was hard. It was. I mean, I think next time we see you do it. I'll get hit by everyone. I won't be able to avoid one. It was pretty awesome. Well done. Appreciate it. All right. The science is in. He's going to be better than LeBron. Bomani, are you intrigued? Put that on All-Star Weekend. Like, I mean, if you're at the NBA and you're watching that and you're not immediately thinking about how we get this into All-Star Weekend, you shouldn't even have that job. Poppy, are you intrigued? I don't know what happened. What happened there? <laughs> okay. You got to give me a technical explanation. You know, what is this? He evaded four shots there. Well, you got to end for his head, you know? You, 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 you got, you got, he's there. You got to look this way. And when he thinks he's not going to throw the ball, then you throw the ball at him. That's the way you get him. You can't play straight with this guy. He's too smart. My father recused himself from voting on it just to oh, give see, you that see, very, very serious intrigued. dodgeball analysis. <laughs> on Comcast Chicago, Padres and Cubs. Uh, no, thank you. Cubs not playing very well in defense of their championship. There's a play at the plate here, though. Yesterday, Rizzo's coming in. San Diego's manager called this a cheap play. I defy you to name San Diego's manager. Go ahead. Woo! Ooh, 
Yeah, we don't do that anymore in baseball. We don't collide into the catcher anymore in baseball. He was dead in rights, too. Yeah, that wasn't a dirty play a couple of years ago. Now that's a dirty play. Feeling the effects of Anthony Rizzo running him over. Omani, are you intrigued, sir? Nah, man, I think it was always a dirty play when you raise your knees up and hit the dude in the kidney. I don't recall ever seeing that. Either he's the worst feet flirt slider of all time, or oh, that was shenanigans. Papi, are you intrigued? Oh, see, see, I'm very intrigued. Police in that catcher is a rookie, but if I'm that catcher, I just go for a, for you know the matador move. I just go like that, you know, with my cape and try oh, to just, ask me, just touch him. You know, I'm not going to block the plate. Are you kidding me? You know, I'm I'm not going to do that. You know, let let him just 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 you know just give him a fine touch on the side. That's all. With his cape. Let him score with well, a cape. Most of us use our capes for fighting crime. If you didn't watch baseball before and I told you there was a matador on play doing that, you'd watch. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for watching. Sorry, I was looking at my phone. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Gracias. See you mañana. This show is going to be on ESPN News. That's right. What the f*** are we sitting around here? Yeah, let's right. get out okay. of here. I'm surprised. We're going to have about yeah. four viewers yeah. today. There you go. See, look at that. That's right. Four That's viewers today. That's it. No you, respect waste, for us. Wasting his time.